Outdoors Maryland is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Coming up, outdoor adventure goes to the dogs. Good dogs. Getting back to the land, one plot at a time. And masters of the kitchen discovering the Chesapeake. Next. Outdoors Maryland is produced in cooperation with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, DNR. Inspired by nature, guided by science. Fresh fallen snow blankets the Western Maryland landscape. A popular winter destination, Garrett County boasts an annual average snowfall of 120 inches, nearly twice that of Fairbanks, Alaska. And while many venture here for the winter activities surrounding the lake, a growing number of thrill seekers answer their call of the wild in the nearby surrounding hills. Gee! We run dog teams. Let's go. Anywhere from six. Let's go, guys. To 14 dogs. 63 feet. Linda Lee Herdering's a native Marylander. She and husband Mike run Husky Power dog sledding on 800 acres of parkland near Deep Creek. This has been our dream when Mike retired from the Marine Corps. Hi, Poppy. Who wants a loving? We're a dog sledding touring business, and we also teach people how to mush dogs, and we give dog sledding rides. They're here about four hours, no matter what kind of tours, seeing the equipment, meeting the dogs. So we love to share, first of all, and we love to teach. This is Indy, and Indy's one of our team dogs. He's out of that same racing kennel that Colt, Jag, and Charger are from in Indiana. One of today's guest mushers is Josh Broded from Pittsburgh. I really didn't know what to expect. I sort of expected a uh, the wooden classic toboggan sled, you know, the one that you see in, in movies and TV shows. Brad Williams from Baltimore will be teaming up with Josh on today's run. I thought all sleds had rails, and they don't. Um, a lot of these dogs are raced and ran on wheeled sleds. I didn't know that. There's so much more to the sport than a runner's sled. A huge part of mushing is dry land mushing, and it's on wheels. It's not necessarily on dry land. It's um, snow, fluffy snow, mud. Our wheeled sled is actually more fun than a runnered sled. So we bring a lot more dogs with the wheeled sled, and that's exciting. So the musher standing here, which will be you at certain times, and it steers like a bicycle, and it has Breaks like a bicycle. While Linda finishes up with Josh and Brad, Mike and Kara, the apprentice, prepare the dogs for the day's adventure. I know I love you too, bud. Ready to go for a run today? Yeah. We're going. We're going. This is all about the dogs, and uh, you have to be a dog person uh, to do this. To be successful in mushing, you have to become dog. So you have to be able to relate with them. Uh, every, every movement of their body uh, is telling you something. Every vocalization that they do is telling you something, and you have to learn that. So we spend a lot of time with the dogs. Bishop is out of Lance Mackey's kennel in Fairbanks. Lance is the winningest long-distance musher in the world today. So right now, you're looking at one of the greatest long-distance athletes in the world on land. Our dogs get more attention than any pet ever dreamed of getting. So uh, being part of, of the dog family is, is a big part of the business. 
Every one of them has a personality, and you have to learn that personality. Sit. The team is harnessed and hooked to the line as the kennel yard turns from relatively tranquil to all-out chaos. First of all, it starts in the dog yard watching how excited the dogs get. They are extremely bananas. They just love to go. They love their job. They love their work. They run around and scream like crazy, take me, take me. And so watching them being hooked up to the lines is part of the experience. Get another dog! There's two out there. Get Indy! Mike and Kara ready the last of the team as Linda gives some final instructions to the mushers. You have to be ready to break. So you're watching those dogs, and you're standing here, and you have to squeeze these hard. Here's what's hard about that. You have to let go to go. <laughs> so you have to do, you have to let go and hold on at the same time. That's sort of an oxymoron, let go and hold on. So you've got the brakes squeezed, you're holding them, and you, let, you say, ready, hike, ready, hike, and you let go, and they jerk. And so jam your hand in like this. So... You're sort of holding on, like, you know, like this. And, and if you're leaning over, you won't be jerked off the back. With the final dogs in place, Mike gives the command. Ready? Hop! Hold on. Stay on, guys. We run on 800 acres of county land. We see a lot of scenery. We have wooded trails. We have pastures we go through. We have scenes of the ski slopes. But you know what? None of that matters because we're watching the dogs. We allow guests to yell commands at the dogs. We talk about different skills, like taking the corners wide. Up there, this is their mile-eating pace. They can run 40, 50 miles a day at this pace if it's cold enough. An Iditarod team can run 80 to 90 miles a day. Slow them down. When I tell you to yell straight on, now. Straight on! Oh, they're nice and cool today, so they're having a great time. So happy, right? Yep. Well, as you can see, I don't have to make them go. But you have to understand their thought process is we're going for a run. Your job, musher, is to hold on. Apparently, that's easier Gee. said than done. As they round the turn, Mike momentarily around. loses his grip, Woo! but makes a Good quick dogs. recovery. They almost threw me off that time. It's more intense than you would think. There's so much torque that these dogs have at their command. I mean, they go from standing still to full speed in an instant. And so you just can really feel their power when you first start going. Easy, whoa. The team stops to check the dogs and change drivers. I'm going to put Josh back on as soon as we get on to Zaza's. It's generally very nasty, whether it's raining and, and sleet and snow or wind and cold. So you got to have a certain amount of adventure in your spirit to uh, want to do this. A lot of people don't appreciate winter, but I, uh, I enjoy it. So I wanted to get out and kind of a different perspective on it. The ride winds down as they travel the trail that leads back home. Bishop? Bishop does not look tired at all. <laughs> While this tour may be coming to an end, the work's just beginning. And the next day, it all starts again. It takes a lot of dedication. This is not a, a nine to five job. It's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week job. We love the dogs and it's about the dogs, but we love sharing the sport. Everyone that comes leaves here saying, wow, I didn't know that. There's such a passion here for what they do. You can feel it. The dogs have passion, the people have passion. I wasn't expecting that I'd be able to, to steer and to command the dogs. That was a nice surprise. You got to get out there and enjoy Maryland, even in the dead of winter. On a late October morning at the Long Reach Community Garden in Columbia, volunteers are observing a seasonal ritual. What we do twice a year is have a cleanup day. Site manager Cleve Chick. 
The fall cleanup for a lot of gardeners symbolizes the end of the garden season. End of the year cleanup is extremely important. Turn your soil over, put your fertilizer down, and be ready to go. It makes it easier in the spring, and it's a good time to be out here with your fellow gardeners and close up for the season. Everybody works together on all the common grounds, and then now I'm over here in my part of the garden just pulling up all my old dead tomatoes and my weeds. We got to dig these dahlia bulbs up before the frost, or they actually rot. Which ones are the dahlias? These ones? Ryan Shreve and Mike Kohler are newcomers to the community. At age 25, Ryan has impressive gardening skills. I've been gardening since I was five years old, and it's always been a part of me. It's something I love to do. Oh, these are the small variety. Yeah. OK. When I first applied to the Long Reach Garden Center, there was a 250-person waiting list. Three years later, I have a plot, and I'm very happy that I do. So her concern is really Ursula Kraljevic manages plot assignments and helped get Ryan started. He's a fantastic gardener. He really knows what he's doing. You know, he knows what to plant when in sequence. So he's really, he's, he's a delight. There are over 150 small plots and two blocks at Longreach. Members rent their plots from Howard County for $35 a year and receive a lot of support. It's part of a program that uses public lands to encourage residents to get outside and garden. This place is an extreme bargain. We have the water, we have manure, we have mulch, wood chips provided by the city. All that stuff is essential in order to have a successful garden. For a small amount of money, I get a year's worth of joy. I come out in the spring, starting in March, and start cleaning up. Plan everything in May, maintain it throughout the summer. Then we come out once a year in the fall and throw it all away. Ryan and Mike's first year wasn't easy, if gardening ever is. A very wet and cold spring delayed planning. May and June were fine months, but July was like an oven. Extremely dry here. We are fortunate enough to have water, so people here watering every single day. With tender, loving care, crops started coming in by early August. But there was another problem. Just as the harvest reached its peak, the stink bugs, they, they came out of somewhere, and they destroyed pretty much everything. Making it worse, the weather turned. We've had more rain this year, probably more rain than I've seen in my life. While some packed it in, most gardeners kept at it, each in their own way. I like a little melting pot. Quite a few different nationalities out here. There's different cultures. They garden different. The Korean gardeners, they do a lot of viney gardening and a lot of peppers, sweet potatoes. And the Chinese gardeners, they do a lot of that gardening up on trestles. Squash, peppers, onions, chives. Geo Africans, they do just a lot of leafy veggies. Alex Kule Thomas has planted his African heritage in Maryland soil. In Nigeria, I think the Yoruba call these Awidu, and in Sierra Leone, the Creole people call it Crane Cray, and um, the English name for it is called Jute, so it's Jute Leaf. Gardening is in European blood as well. Sadat Serbegovic's family comes from Bosnia. Father was a good gardener he he knew he was advanced you know he went on some uh, co competitions and won some prizes zongying montgomery appreciates all that gardening provides gardening in china is most for getting food on the table here is for fun and i feel i can stay outside see get some fresh air plus i can meet the wonderful people make some friends your garden looks good thank you Trying to make it a better. <laughs> Ryan found inspiration in the different styles. The Asian gardeners are meticulous. The way they prepare their rows to the way they plant them, it's, it's symmetric. Everything about them, it's perfect. The more Americanized gardeners, per se, a little more sloppy, a little more throw it down, see what grows. It's neat. We can learn from each other. And you got to open your ears and listen. Regardless of style, the best fertilizer is time spent working your plot. Some gardeners, 
believe that they can just put a seed in the ground and walk away and come back and have a bountiful crop, but it doesn't work that way. It takes time to have a great garden. And I tell it in, I, I use a lot of stuff If a gardener struggles, help is never far away. If I have a new gardener and they don't know what to do, uh, we, anyone will help them. Any questions, you just tell, ask us and we will give you, we will give you seeds, we will help you. Um, planting, we, you know, we, we help each other. I have organic food. It's a rare gardener who doesn't want to show off what they grow. Tomatoes, string beans, kale. It's called borage. You, you can eat the leaves. These are my blackberries. Great production this year. This is a volunteer. I think it's going to be a pumpkin. I don't know. So I'm just going to let it go and see what it's going to be. The entire garden has a charming ramshackle appearance with evidence of improvisation everywhere. In block number two, five plots are set aside for the Howard County Food Bank. Francis Handy. We want our families to have a healthy diet. Last year, we harvested 900 pounds of food. We're hoping that the rest of the fall harvest will increase that. Despite the drought, late summer began to yield an impressive crop. You get that triumph when you get your first red tomato or your first patch of green beans and the, the first big red beets you pull out of the ground. It's like opening a Christmas package every day when you come out and see all the vegetables and the fruit, and it's always a surprise. On the average, right now, we've been picking about 50 pounds of big boy tomatoes a day. The natural consequence of a bountiful harvest is sharing. If you say to this gardener, this is really great looking, a lot of times they will add, tell you, do you want to have it? I never used to use basil. I use basil now because someone told me to use it with tomatoes, bruschetta. You know, it's, it's, you learn a lot in the garden. That's what you do. Being outdoors and growing your own produce, that's basics. I mean, we've been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. Just being out here and being away, no telephone calls. That's nice. By late October, the last of the summer crops are taken in. With frost on the way, the Long Reach gardeners clean up a year's worth of undergrowth and begin making plans for next year. When's the earliest we can start? Rhubarb. Most gardeners are optimistic that the next season always can get better. It's not been an easy year by any means, but just wait until next year. I'll show the stink bugs and the weather, for sure. <laughs> <laughs>